The Museum of Contemporary Art Denver presents Practicing Citizenship, a conversation series featuring artists, activists, and experts exploring civic engagement. Tonight, we bring you a conversation with artist Nan Golden. And now, here's Sarah Bai, MCA Denver's Director of Programming. Hello everyone, I'm Sarah Bai, the Director of Programming at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Denver. And this is Practicing Citizenship, a program series MCA Denver is producing in conjunction with the exhibition, Citizenship, a Practice of Society. We are coming to you live every Wednesday night throughout the run of the exhibition. And tonight we present a conversation with Nan Golden on art and activism. I'm joined tonight by artists Nan Golden and Tani Bruguera. We are thrilled to present this amazing programming during the pandemic, and we're thrilled that you are joining us, but it takes a lot to put this all together. If you have the means, please consider donating to support MCA Denver. We suggest a donation of $10, which is what we would normally charge for tickets, but of course, any amount helps, and thank you for your support. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Nan and Tanya. Nan Golden is one of the most influential photographers working today. In 2018, Nan published a series of photographs and an essay in Art Forum that revealed her own struggle with addiction and called for the art world to hold accountable the famously philanthropic Sackler family for their role in the opioid crisis. The Sacklers own Purdue Pharma, the makers of Oxycontin. Nan photo Nan's photographs from this exhibition or from this series are included in the exhibition Citizenship, which is on view at MCI Denver. And Nan joins us today from New York. Tanya Bruguera is a politically motivated performance artist whose work explores the relationship between art, activism, and social change, specifically the promise and failings of the Cuban Revolution. Tanya joins us today from Cuba, where she has been detained under house arrest following protests with 27 in, a group advocating for artistic freedom for artists and intellectuals in Cuba. On November 27th, Tanya and other Cuban artists met with officials about the rep repression of the cultural sector. These artists had declared a hunger strike in protest of the arrest of the Cuban rapper, Dennis Solis. As part of the conditions of her detainment, Tanya has had her internet taken from her by the state. In order to ensure that we could document this conversation, we pre-recorded it last week. As you will see, the quality is not perfect, but we felt very lucky to have Tanya join Nan for this program on art and activism. Because it was pre-recorded, the artist will not be taking questions in the chat tonight, but you can chat. Please keep it respectful and please join me in welcoming Nan and Tanya. I'm really excited to talk to you. Really excited. Same here, lots, same lots, here. Of, lots of things that we have in common and things I'm curious about. But first, tell me what's going on. Well, right now, I've read we about, are, yeah. Yeah, I've read a lot, but I, I want to know from you. Well, thank you. No, basically, we are in a very, I want to dare to say, historic moment because. Uh, the more than 400 people uh, demonstrating in front of, of the Ministry of Culture and demand to be heard by the Minister of Culture uh, to ask them to stop the harassment with the independent artists. You know, the day before, the night before the government entered, actually broke the door of somebody's house, a group of artists who were in hunger strike in order to ask the, the freedom of one of the uh, collaborators uh, and police broke the door and took them out of it and um, and everybody was shocked i mean we can or not agree with what these people were protesting about we can agree or not about their political point of view but i think everybody got like enraged by the way artists were you know, treated, and the fact that the homes homes were the last space yeah. we had 
to protest because we cannot do anything on the street. So even the houses now are going to be taken away from us. So I think everybody was indignados. You know, they were very enraged. And the next morning, a lot of people start spontaneously saying, we have to do something. We have to go and to a place to demonstrate. And then slowly everybody came to the Ministry of Culture. When I arrived, somebody called me and said, you have to be here. And when I arrived, it was like maybe 18, 20 people. And in a few hours, there were hundreds of people. So it was wow. very beautiful. Wow. It was very beautiful. That gorgeous. That's gorgeous. And, and I'm proud to say that the artists did it. For many years, yeah. people wanted to do protests in the street, and it was the artists who went this out. The and this is the first time. No, you've been protesting in the street a lot. It is the long. first of the scale. It's the first of the social scale. I mean, there have been all the moments where some people went out that there were like 20 people, 30, 50, maybe, but this was like 400 people, 370, 400. And across the day, there were 500 people. We, we had a list. We had somebody taking people's name and list of, of counting. Really? And Never heard of that. It That's was amazing. It was amazing. And actually, the government was forced because the people were outside to meet with independent artists. And this was the first time ever that the government had to sit down with independent journalists and independent artists, because they always make separation between, uh, for example, in Cuba, I'm not an artist. As soon as I land, I lose my status of artist, which is totally ridiculous. As well? I didn't understand. And um, so they have it. No, as soon as I land in Cuba, I cease to be an artist, yeah. the ass of government, you know? So wow. they decide who is and who is not an artist. And basically what was amazing is for the first time they met independent uh, journalists and independent artists. And that was a big, for me already wow. that's a big game. Whatever comes that's after, true. it is what it is. Yeah. yeah you so have tell to me remember you. that. No, no, tell me what happened after that. You were arrested but many then, times this weekend. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this was very sad because we ended the four hour meeting with this, uh, like five agreements with the government. And like in less what? than 24 hours, for example, they agreed to release one of our companions. Yeah. And this I is know. the only thing they did. Um, we demanded a fair uh, process for the rapper who was in prison. This right. is still not happening. We also demand a ceasefire against the independent artists, meaning do not defame, criminalize us on TV and do not uh, let us have like a zone of tolerance so we can meet to prepare the next meeting with you. And in less than 24 hours, they broke almost all of those because the wow. vice minister was in the TV talking like distorting everything that happened in the meeting and say that some of us were paid by foreigner governments and like saying a lot of like arguments that don't work anymore because you cannot say like today was a beautiful a fun man like me this in the internet uh, saying that the Pentagon uh, is closing because it's paying too many Cubans to process <laughs> they don't have enough money <laughs> so we ran out, we ran out of money <laughs> they run out of money because so many people brothers are supposed to be paid by <laughs> you know so yeah so i think the arguments are very old and very ridiculous so it's not working this is an interesting paradigm right now because the government is against itself against its old system mm -hmm. that is not working no what i mean by that is they 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 use to justify everything they do in certain ways and those justifications are not being believed by anybody anymore. You know, like it's very so, clear it's, it's fake, you know. How are people reacting to it? Is there more protest? It has been, it has been very, very beautiful. The next day, a lot of people protest in other provinces more. And unfortunately, after two days, after three days of the meeting, they put in house arrest almost the 30 people who enter as representative of the 500 of the 400. Um, wow. We cannot go out. I, I cannot go out of the house for any reason, not even to buy bread. Um, you know, it's very intense. It's the Sunday I went out because I didn't see them. So I thought, oh, they 
left it. They, they, and then they came like a like a movie, like a whole like and then opening oh, the door God. while the car was still running and and I was like, what is going on? You know, I'm just going to the corner, you know. And then I and even I told him, you know, you. if you don't want me to go out, it's like insane. And like I say, if you don't want me to go out, I can co- go back home. Don't worry. I mean, you don't need to detain me. I don't want to be detained. And they say, go to inside the car. Go inside the car. I'm like, okay. Well, it's like, well, who no, are it's, they? it's very crazy. They're in so plain they, clothes. Right? They're in plain clothes, right? They were. They are in plain clothes, but they are the state department, the state uh, security police, like the state police. And this yeah, is happening so with all our our friends. We have like almost twenty people right now who are house in house arrest and some of the people uh for example the government went to the landlord where they were rent in a rent and forced the landlord to evict the activists which is like Whoa. yeah Whoa. it's quite insane I've never and, heard of before. Yeah, what happened and also we were evicted well, now they are trying to find another place to stay because they were evicted from the rent because the government during house demanded. arrest they get evicted during house arrest. Yeah, yeah, this is very insane. Yeah, yeah. very insane. And um, and the other people like there was a journalist who just put a little comment on Facebook, and after working twenty years in an official newspaper, he was uh, fired because he put wow. a comment. A little comment on Facebook sympathizing with the cause. Like, wow. this is. So they're really insane. out there. They're going it's like out of the proportion. Internet, too, right? They're doing, uh, yeah. they're scrubbing social media, right? Trying yeah, to find. Yeah, yeah. Social media has helped us a lot. Yeah. Yeah. But it now, sometimes it goes, I mean, in America, too, during the Black Lives Matter protests, the yeah. internet was, you know, essential. But then they, mm-hmm. They do so much work to, you know, investigate the people on internet. So that's the uh, exactly. Yeah. Well, here they they are experts on that. Yeah, they are experts. Yeah. yeah. So tell me what is going on there. What is going on with your work and, and your I classes? <laughs> I want to hear more about you. Like, what's <laughs> it? What do they do when they arrest you? They inter- They actually interrogate me. Yeah, they actually interrogate, they interrogate, and uh, the one thing that is interesting is you are retained for as long as the campaign online and on social media um, takes track. Like, as soon as a social media campaign for liberating anyone who is arrested, they, they release it because they're very afraid of social media. So that's quite right. interesting. So what happens when they, social media, they release people? Yeah, as soon as somebody is, as soon as we know that somebody's been taken, we start a campaign online, and they're they're monitoring all the time um, yeah. social media, so they know. And as soon as this campaign become huge, they release the people. Oh, so that's good. It is, power. it is it interesting. is interesting. Yeah. It, in the United States, there is always this conversation about. Oh, like Facebook is not useful, like likes is not enough, blah, blah, blah. social media is not. But in Cuba, it does work because they know that this is an opinion, is a way to get people's opinions. So they're very afraid of that. Yeah. Yeah. And are so, you in Twitter? Do you, you use Twitter as well? Yeah, yeah. Twitter has been amazing. Yeah. Also, because That's people are cool. tweeting directly to the government and it has been quite intense. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And I'm so yeah. proud of you. What started, what started the so, hunger story? Well, so it was it was a group of people. It was a very big group of artists, and I I was just called to join. So yeah, no. What the um, the hunger strike started because one rapper that is of course uh, critical to the government was taken into prison. And the reasoning that that people have is not so much what is the cause. Uh, that he was taken, it was the process. It was not a due process. They um, they uh, judged this guy in less than 48 hours without a lawyer, without witnesses, without nothing. So we are asking that whatever thing he did, 
to be go uh, go through the law. We don't want to change that. If he did something wrong, okay, you can judge him, whatever. But we do process because so they, had everybody trial, they had a trial without any uh, witnesses, without yeah, any with our yeah. lawyer, with a defense lawyer, without witness, without not like less than like, less than forty eight hours. So it was very irregular and illegal, actually, to do that. That's what happens normally in America, I hate to say. Yeah. <laughs> well, but this is what they do. This is what happened in Cuba, that the law is uh, bending for political reasons. Yeah. So when it is a, an artist that is uncomfortable for them, then the law doesn't apply. You know, yeah. they do whatever they want and they pretend it's legal. So I think this is why so many people, so many people were like out in the street because like you cannot treat an artist that way. I think everybody understood if they do that to them, they'll do it to us, you know, they'll right. do it to everybody. Like but, I mean, you cannot, like that's a limit. That's that's kind of a too too far, no? Yeah. You've been arrested regularly. Yeah, like, not that I, I don't like it though. I know. <laughs> that's that's I, pursue. That. I don't pursue it's it. Not I don't like it. Either. I've been arrested once and I was terrified, just terrified. <laughs> I'm, I'm so impressed. <laughs> well, but here you, you, you know, when you are, uh, when you are detained, I'm so mad that I cannot be afraid because my, my, yeah, I'm too mad because I, it's so unfair, you know? That's great. The anger yeah. protects you. I love <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And did they try to shut down your internet? Yeah, I mean, at the moment, I don't have internet on my phone. I bought a second line to the plan. They discovered the second line, so now I don't have internet also on the second line. So now I'm talking through a way I cannot tell you. So if they discover, okay. they take it off again. <laughs> yeah, don't so, tell me. yeah, yeah. So it's very hard to to communicate at the moment because. They and this is something I as soon as this ends, I'm going to go to to the you know to the offices of the telephone company here, which is a monopoly because there's only one, to to ask them why they cut my internet. So they're you know, why government. Com yeah, it's it's a government agency. Yeah, it's a government business. Wow. But I think we should ask them because they treat us as, as capitalists clients uh, but they behave as you know a, a section of the minister of interior yeah, yeah. i'm so, so sorry that uh, happened to you how long have yeah, you been in health well uh, i was 11 days before in house arrest then ironically they took away the the you know the surveillance the day of the protest i think they didn't know the protest was happening and then uh, on Friday, they put their house arrest again. Yeah. And we don't know because I asked them what this is for. They say, you don't need to know. You just can't go out. And I say, how long? They say, we'll let you know. So I have Whoa. no idea how long it's going to happen. Whoa. Yeah. And, when and I, to be honest, I don't want to create the problem. So I don't want to go out or defy them or anything. I, I'll, you know, I want to complain. And, and do I mean not that I agree what is happening, but I think I don't want to create problem, you know, problems. And are you able to work from home? Yeah, yeah, a little bit, but my brain is like, yeah, I can. It's, it's like it's not uh, in a creative mode exactly. It's more in a political mode because we are organizing the groups and and you know and and realizing what we're going to do, what is the next action, and for example, we want to. We are preparing with some lawyers uh, and um, illegal actions against the the national news uh, newscast because they defame they defame us on TV. Yeah. So we want to we are preparing now a, a class action. I think it's called in English, like a group action uh, demanding. You know, I mean, we don't want money or anything. We just want them to you know retract <laughs> from what they have said and, yeah. and, and say yeah. the truth because this is affecting us uh, in legally you know yeah there's definitely a reputation are there in america are there laws like that in cuba yeah yeah absolutely absolutely yeah. so absolutely. i am so naive about cuba 
Well, first of all, when you get out of house arrest, are you planning to leave? I don't know. It was quite fun that the other day, first of all, the, the in the interrogation, they told me that I was being, uh, a case against me was being prepared for crimes against the state, which is the highest, wow. uh, you know, this is the great, the most great uh, thing is how is um, life imprisonment. And uh, and I say okay, just bring it on because everything you told me is not true. So bring it on, you know. And then after that, they, they, they the next interrogation, they say, well, if you want to leave the country, let us know. We can make it easy, quick, and without any trouble. So I think okay. they're willing to buy me a ticket to go out of the country. Well, you don't, then you don't course, want to, right? If you hear that, my answer know. was. My answer was, if I wanted to leave before, now I don't want to leave. <laughs> right, exactly. You want me out, I'm not going anywhere. Yeah, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> I'm so impressed. Yeah. I, I mean, we don't need to talk about political art. No, no. <laughs> no I'm, I'm, I'm really impressed with so many people who went there and how disciplined they were. You know, in demonstration, there is always infiltrated people who want to create yeah. trouble and so on. People were so disciplined, so good, so like respectful. So it was really, I'm very impressed. It was really a beautiful demonstration of civic uh, gallery. And yeah. Are you saying that's a big, that's one of the only big demonstrations in Cuba? Yeah, yeah. It's the first time in, at this scale, the first time. And yeah. especially for artists as well. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's very it's very unusual. I had no idea because there's yeah, fifty thousand yeah. people at you know Black Lives Matters, Black yeah, Trans. No. Yeah. Actually, one of the problems that we have here is that there is some institutional racism in Cuba, and it's not recognized. And if you actually say in a meeting or in your art or whatever that there is institutional racism in Cuba or even racism, you are accused of bringing foreigners' agendas into the right. country. You know, so there is so, not even a point of discussion at this point. You know? It's not even like a. Yeah. Within the artistic and literary community, is the discussion about that? about racism? Not so much. It has been some attempt to have it, but uh, especially some journalists have brought it up and some artists did uh, a few years ago an exhibition called Keloides mm -hmm. and uh, all black um, artists and they were very heavily criticized by the government. Very, And some of them had to leave the country because they were really criticized and and the problem here with censorship, I know there is censorship everywhere, you know, but yeah. the problem here is that censorship take over every aspect of your life. You know, they, they touch your family. Sometimes your family is being fired from their job because of you doing this work. Uh, you know, it's taking everything. So there is a kind of uh, asphyxiation with censorship because you, you don't have any place where you, you can breathe, you know. Wait, uh away from so it. must encourage a lot of people if their families are involved yeah it was beautiful that at the protest um you saw the people you know the young people with their moms that was a so lot. beautiful yeah because and i asked i asked the mom of a friend of mine who actually my friend is 50 but the mom came with him and i said why are you here it's like i'm afraid i'm a kid and i want to be here and that was the, the guy was 50, mother. The guy, the guy, yeah, was my 50 friend and the is 50. Was... My friend is 50, oh, wow. and the friend is 74. So, oh, wow. the mother, the 74 year old mother, came with a 50 year old kid you know, because she was afraid that uh, something happened because it was the first time and then nobody knew what would, what would happen, you know. And we were surrounded by police and some tear gas and stuff, so yeah. Um, it was beautiful to see the moms coming with the kids, no? Even yeah, if the kids know. were old. <laughs> exactly. What's your relationship with your family? With my family? Yeah. Well, now, well, I lost my mom recently and I lost my dad. So now I'm, I only have my sister. 
And my sister is the best. She's my yeah. half. You're lucky. You're really lucky. Yeah, I'm very lucky with my sister, uh, to be honest. She's the best. She is the best. Did your and family, you, you, your, did your parents support you? Your politics? My family, my family, yes. My father, my mom, yes. My father, not so much because my father was part of the government. Right. And my mother, my mother, yes. My mother, my mom uh, grew up in New York, actually, because they escaped. Uh, the dictatorship of Batista. So she was raised in New York. So she was very outspoken and she knew what freedom was and she always pursued it. So she gave me that. I was very lucky. Yeah, you are. I was very lucky. Yeah. So, you know, I, it's hard for me to admit this, but, you know, my idea of Cuba comes from the 60s where Che Guevara was a big hero. So mm -hmm. I need to understand a little bit, if you can tell me what happened. Mm. Well, I think Cuba is, a, you, is an amazing case study uh, on propaganda. I think they are the best propagandists in the world. They work long term. So I know people now who adore Cuba because 20 years ago they came in a trip that was sponsored by the government. And in a way, it reminds me a little bit the Israeli uh, the Israeli um, uh, occupation. Uh, yeah, occupation no, 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 no. The you know the Israel has these programs that they bring Jewish people from other places to say in the yeah. kibbutz and to come and, and kids coming early on and experience yeah. being in Israel. So Cuba is the same, but with the left. Oh, really? You know, they, oh, no. they, they, they. Yeah, they do that. They bring people from the left. To, to stay here, have an amazing experience, and have these beautiful memories of the place. It's a very smart, very well done. But of course, these so, are all... Um, currently, they're doing this? They still do that. They still do wow. that. They're still doing that. I have. They still bring students from universities, and then when they go to these, uh, you know, um, classes, what they talk, these things are not real, you know. Uh, they 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 to to these uh, kids who come from different universities from the U.S. and it's very smart. They are very smart. Now you have to give them. They're very smart and and they doing the long term game. And so yeah, they, of course, so far. How did it go from a revolutionary and, country to an imperialist dictatorship? What happened? I don't know. I want to know that. I will. Not, that's what I'm trying to search. What happened? Yeah. What happened? You know? <laughs> what happened? I think it was. I think it was. I don't know. I think power corrupts, as you know. And now, I think Fidel stay was amazing. I think the first ten years of the revolution were the most beautiful. You know, programs and and really hopeful and really like humanistic. It was really an amazing project. I, I still love it. I still like that yeah. to exist. Your father was part of that, right? Your father was yeah, part yeah. of that? Yeah, I was part of that. Yeah. And my mom, for example, she was a professor um, they, for um, literacy campaign, the literacy campaign. And she was like very young, 19 or something. So you could see a very beautiful spirit of hope and and doing something for somebody else that for me was very special you know you're doing you sacrificing some of yourself for the good of somebody yeah. else but did over time up, tanya did sorry? you grow up in that did you grow up in that yeah i did grow up in that in the end of that yeah by the end of that yeah, yeah. and i think it is uh, and then over time i think that start changing and things become more more difficult to justify i think the political decisions were very difficult to justify and i think it was more about survival the survival of the people in power and this is when i thought things didn't work anymore you so know, they it, started, became, it became communist in the sense of uh china or yeah uh, and russia yeah, yeah. Yeah, and they start, uh, for example, pushing people away of the country if they think differently, and they they start not, they don't want to hear any complaints, and they, so it started very very softly, like 
like shutting down different opinions, shutting down institutions. That's why when Trump was there, I was really scared oh, wow. because I saw the same process wow. where the government starts uh, taking the trust away from institutions. You know, and I what think that's the thing. What, what happened when Trump was there? What happened? No, when Trump was in the, uh, elected in the United States, oh, yeah. I, I I felt that he was doing the same process where you start distrust, creating distrust um, over institutions like, oh, you don't believe in judge anymore because right. he yeah. did this. Or you don't believe in the press anymore. You don't believe. So he was preparing. Mastermind. Yeah, he he ruined he it all. He was preparing. He was preparing the the road to dictatorship. Yeah, he exactly. stay longer. I have to say. Yeah, I mean, he was bordering on dictatorship. All the rule of law was destroyed. You're right. Yeah. All the institutions. Yeah. Yeah. And this is this is one discussion I had with some of my friends in the U.S. at the very beginning when he was elected. It's like, oh, United States different. I said, yeah, but Cuba was like that. Venezuela was like that. All of these countries were like this, and it slowly. It's slowly because that's just, you know slowly you you start you know a process of of acquiring too much power you know and people little by little accept it. I mean, yeah. with him, he diverted everyone's attention with his tweeting, and the media yeah. gave. I I blame the media as well. They gave so much attention to every single little you know game he played, mm. everything, and not just you know. Uh, the most popular stations in America, cable news, are Fox News, which is basically his cable news. So they get yeah, a totally different reality. It's a totally different reality. There's two Americas now, completely yeah. split. And even the cable news on the left spoke too much about him. Yeah. I think no, I think he knew... He understood the the media, you know, very well, and he used it in his favor. But yeah, yeah. But thank God now we are in a healing process, right? <laughs> I don't know, yeah. Tanya. I don't know. I'm very skeptical. I I'm know. one of the only people still scared that something will happen between now and when Biden goes to the White House. There's another month. No, no, I, no. <laughs> I'm scared of what could happen. What he's going to do. And then, you know, the new, the new regime, the new, you know, Biden's okay. I mean, we only voted for him because of Trump, obviously. He's not, a ra you know, he's not radical enough. He's not really yeah. interested in the, you know, policies we want. So then we're going to have another fight, but it's a softer fight. It's less. The fight never ends, unfortunately. Yeah. The fight never ends. <laughs> yeah. Well, tell me more about you. What are you working on? What are you? So, you know, I have this group pain, right? That fight started fighting the Sackler family in the museums. Mm -hmm. And How is it going? Um, we had a lot of success. I don't know when I met you if this had happened, that a lot of museums stopped taking their money. And then they went into bankruptcy court. And so we oh. followed them there. And it's like the least sexy place you can be. We understand nothing of bankruptcy law. But we followed them there. And we started another group called Oxy Justice, which is made up of, first of all, we made a website so that creditors could sign up to try to get to the people who, the people themselves who'd been harmed. And we managed to get it extended a month. And we were giving people instructions on how to fill out these forms. And then we started our lawyer, who's a pro bono lawyer, and their lawyers, Sacklers, Purdue lawyers, are literally paid $24 million a month. And our lawyer is pro bono, one guy. And we're a group of five. The rest of them are parents who lost their children to OxyContin. So, He's been filing these motions in court that are so crazy and that are actually calling, saying that there's two justices in America, one for billionaires and one for the rest of us, and talking about the needs of the victims and getting the courts. The, the judge at the beginning was 
our group is called the Ad Hoc Committee on Accountability. And at the beginning, the judge was completely dismissing us and calling us the so-called group of accountability. And now he's listening to us. But he's about, then the Department of Justice, which is completely corrupt here, it's led by one of the worst of the players, this guy Barr. They came in. Yeah. They came in uh, and filed charges. Uh, actually, um, charges against the company that the Sacklers own, Purdue, which is what's in bankruptcy. The business went in bankruptcy. The Sacklers had already taken all the money out of the business. But the judge was also protecting the Sackler family, which is unheard of. Normally, they don't protect the people who are running the company, just the company is there. So oh. they, the uh, DOJ filed, actually found them guilty of federal crimes. And not, but not the Sacklers, just Purdue. And Find them eight billion or something, which they'll never pay. But also, they were guilty of um, of paying doctors off, guilty of making these websites that made people immediately um, the doctors immediately prescribe oxycontin, the, the uh, pharmacists. So all of that was very depressing because the Sacklers weren't named. And then last week, it was announced that there are going to be congressional hearings against the factors. And this is huge. This is a huge victory. That's great. Yeah. That's great. We're That's right. Congratulations. No. Yeah. This is huge. Congratulations. Uh, I think the system is very important. What? what Persistence is very important. Yeah. Three years of this I've been doing. And... Um, the letter that Congress wrote is very exciting to me because it says, we don't think the Sacklers are ever going to agree to come, so we're issuing a subpoena to force them to come. And nobody wow. has ever stood up to the Sacklers like that. Yeah, it's wow. very And it's next week. Congratulations. Yeah. This is huge. Yeah, it's something. It's yeah. at least something. I admire you very much for this. This is, this is huge. This is real real change wow but they, who knows who knows what will happen in congress but there's also um this stuff that's come out about a pr group called mckinsey and they're all over the world they're the one of the best pr companies in the world they actually uh give advise you know saudi arabia they're really dirty really dark and these papers came out that they were advising the Sacklers and they wanted to turbocharge the sales of OxyContin when there started to be pushback against OxyContin and the mm -hmm. Sacklers' money was starting to go down, the sales were going down. And they, want, they advised them to pay a rebate to insurers and pharmacists if somebody died of an overdose. $14,000 we were worth. Oh my God! Yeah, that this is, is this is yeah. That's so yeah. immoral. I mean, it's wow. the it's about as evil as it gets. So oh my God. I think we're gonna start going after these people too. I mean, it's hugely powerful, but yeah. So. Wow, Actually, yeah, you should. I'm looking forward to the Hollywood version of this. The movie uh, they have to do a movie about this. No, because I tell you something. I I feel this is amazing because not only the cyclists but everybody else around and with similar business, uh, you yeah. know, practice, must be really scared and regrouping and thinking what else can we do to not have this problem. So I think yeah. this is this it's is destroying documents and. But the Sacklers have been, you know, because of our campaign in the museums, and you know, the museums were were where the Sacklers live, like emotionally, mentally. That's where their reputation, yeah. and they use the museums to avoid any scrutiny, and to appear as great philanthropists. And the most important mm -hmm. thing to these people was their reputation, and we destroyed that. 
we have three amazing. displays. How yeah. how have the art world taken this? How how they like you know museums in the U.S. are struggling quite a bit for money. Yeah. So how what response did you get from the institution and and from museums? Like how did they react to that? Are they you know? There's always the argument that that they can't uh, afford to not take the money. That's always the argument with museums. Mm -hmm. And uh, if they start going into all the board members, there's not a lot of clean billionaires. Yeah. It's, but there's levels of evil, I think. There's right. evil, and then there's 450,000 people dead in front of you. So, right. I, yeah. Um, yeah. The museums have a mandate to be ethical. And I'm always reading the mandate to these directors of museums, reminding them. And our big push now that they got um, charged, that the business got charged with um, federal crimes is to get their names taken down. Nice. What I'm nice. fighting for now. So originally I used, cool. I used my wedge as an artist to start this. Um, by threatening not to have a retrospective at the National Portrait Gallery in London if they took the money and they didn't take the money. And that's what right. started one museum after another. Yeah, I mean, that is an argument that they don't have, uh, that they need the money. But it's not a, a good argument. I don't think it's a good argument. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And for you, how, I mean, how has, like this process, how, what changed on you during this process? It was quite intense and long, you know, three years and constantly learning about legal stuff and like ways in which these entities make stuff to, to you know, hide their stuff. How has it been for you that process? The levels of corruption you hear about, but to actually be that close to it is incredible. I started the campaign when I got out of a clinic for my uh, addiction to OxyContin. And, you know, I, I was very fragile and nervous in the world and shaky. And I think having this group build up my confidence and gave me a mission. I feel like you need something bigger than yourself to stay sober. And so this became bigger than myself. Mm -hmm. And so it helped me enormously. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I, yeah. I feel like you should I, be very proud. You should be super proud of what you're doing. This is really amazing. Yeah. Really amazing. I have to speak to Congress tomorrow. And, and I have to make a statement for a minute. So we're looking forward to it. Yeah. Nice. Now you are a performance artist. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But, you know, I think the whole issue of being in a show about political art, it makes me really question what is political art. And a journalist asked me, you know, during all this political work, what's your practice? And my practice is this movement. This is my practice. And I feel obviously the same as for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But do you do you find hard for people to understand that? A little bit, yeah. Yeah, I do. The art world has um, embraced our activism, but in a distant way. You know, sort of like uh, clicktivism. You know, they're not out in the streets with us, but they support us. But we're working with a lot of um, like grassroots organizations. Um, mostly black led that uh, advocate that really intense called Vocal New York. They advocate for safe consumption sites and homelessness. I mean, um, care of homelessness and housing. And they're the ones who started this um, occupation of City Hall this summer. Did you read about that? No, yeah, no, I've been away for nine months. Yeah. Yeah, for a while. there was an occupation of City Hall in uh, uh, July, August, for lasted a few weeks. It was okay. the little park near City Hall about 
the uh, whole thing of police being held accountable are not for the you know murders of people. It happened after George Floyd. And yeah, there was a big meeting coming up where all the people on the uh, council were voting on whether police should be defunded or not. And so, of course, they didn't win and the police were not defunded. And uh, yeah. so then the, the occupation kind of fizzled out, but it went on for about three weeks. It was very beautiful. So that was another thing I was working on. Yeah. And do you think do you think political art has evolved in the US now? Like not only the appreciation for it, I think that is clear that there are more people willing to exhibit it or discuss it publicly. But do you think it has changed since I don't know the 70s or the because many work, I mean, even your work before the the was political in a way, yeah. because showing this this world was a political gesture, no? But how do you feel it has evolved? Or what difference do you see now from what people are doing now politically as art, political art than before? Well, the one thing that scares me is that museums are showing political art as a means to uh, clean their reputation. Like having a lot of, you know, the Black Lives Matters movement when they were all the museums put out a black square on that day on social media. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yeah. it's seen as somewhat, um, you know, yeah. It's, it's, it, it's also okay. clickism, institutional clickism yeah, exactly. as well. Yeah. But with exhibition. No, I do agree. I agree with you. I think that, sh I think art institutions have to really sit down seriously and rethink what they are for. Exactly. I think there is a crisis now with art institution. They need to rethink what their what their mission is. You know, what are they good for society? Because they cannot keep doing what you just said. You know, like one exhibition to clean their image and keep doing stuff wrong. You know, so I do think they should, yeah, sit down, reevaluate, and and change the culture. You know, the the culture that they have inside the institution as well. You know, not yeah. only what they show, but yeah. Yeah, there's been a lot of um, a lot of uh, political action about people within the museum, the workers, how they're being treated. For example, and, yeah. Yeah, the racial inequality within the museum, uh, the the board people on the board, that a group called Decolonized that started an action mm -hmm. against. Yeah, yeah. He was, uh, his money was from tear gas that was being used in Palestine and on the Mexican border. Yeah. But Netflix and people are writing uh, TV shows for Netflix and Hulu about the Sacklers. And That's I think true. in the end, we need that public outrage. Mm -hmm. That's what's gonna affect them the most. Yeah, I think that's great. And uh, yeah, and have you had a lot of young people? Like, how is that happening with the young people? Like, how are they? I don't know. Joining? How is this? Is the movement growing also in terms of generation, or is just uh... the larger movement? I mean, not Pain. Pain is very small. People come to our protests, but we're like only twelve people. And right now, there's only really three of us that are working and our lawyers that are working constantly. Mm -hmm. But on in the protest in the street, yeah, I'd say that it's very multi-generational. You see yeah, people they, older than me, you see people, children, you see, you know, most of it's led by people in their 20s. One thing people forget is the activism has a side that is drainy and dry and hard which is the lawyer part, the writing yeah. of the text and all the yeah. like, declarations yeah. and getting yeah. together the information, yeah. the data. That's that's not very sexy, but that's the real work. That's what really yeah. makes, yeah. you know, people are going to protest because it's the, it, you know. That's, <laughs> yeah. But the but thing yeah, is, yeah. that distresses me is that 
you know, the whole thing of video and filming the police and having that go viral and how that affected America with George Floyd. Now yeah. there's constant videos of the police killing black men and they're losing their meaning. And that I find it's really- Normalizing, it's normalized. Yeah. It's normalizing, exactly. Yeah. And I don't know what can be done about that. It's what does photography and film really do? It's a question, you know. Yeah, that's another challenge we have as political artists. Like, how do we address these issues without normalizing it or without aestheticizing it in a way that is so beautiful that we lose the vibe? And you know, and, yeah. and also, yeah, and how to make it still like urgent, no? Like, how to capture urgency? This is quite hard uh, for political art, no? Yeah, I mean, what I did last year. I had a show in London and I made a piece about addiction, which to me is a kind of a political piece on the personal level. You know, it's, I mean, one piece about the pleasure of drugs, the euphoria and beauty. And then I made another one about the darkness of addiction. And to me, you know, my own personal work is political. It's always been political. I think so, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's been about yeah. relationships and different, uh, cultures underneath the popular culture and you know yeah. aids and sex and love and all manifestations of it so it's always been political i feel and yours too has always been political but on a no, more I, I agree with you because i think yeah yeah i agree i think political art is not only about politicians or policies it's also okay. about showing what nobody wants to see, you know, like forcing people to see into a world they're trying to ignore. Yeah. And that's Smart. that's political as well. Yeah, I mean, one yeah, of the things absolutely. we're fighting about, the stigma of drugs is one thing we're fighting about too. The stigmatization of drug exactly. users and drug dealers even, you know, small time drug dealers who are just using it Selling to feed their habit, you know. There's, we have no, we support them in a way. There's a group that I was working with called the Drug Users Union, and I raised uh, thirty-five thousand for them so they could buy this thing called a mass spectrometer, so they could actually mm -hmm. test all the drugs on the street. And go, going to meetings with them is really interesting. I mean, it's all on Zoom. How do you feel about having these virtual meetings versus, I, you know, my group is in my living room every Wednesday for two years. And now, you know, we met in the park once, but now we're on Zoom. I'm dying for a good hug, I have to say. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but you're not alone there, are you? Isn't I'm your sorry? sister? You're not alone there, are you? No, my sister is in Italy. So I'm alone here. Yeah. Your sister is not there. No, <laughs> she's ah, in Italy with her, her kid. Ah, I thought you were um, No, no. Yeah. Uh, you're no, doing I think well. It is, it is. No, no, so it's, it's interesting to see all of these social problems and political problems and realizing that, yes, they are hard, they are complex, but there's always a solution. And sometimes the solution might be even there and it's just the will of people to work through that solution, no? To, to try to implement the solution. Well, if you think about, uh, you know, uh, stigma about drugs, I don't see a solution. I mean, what we're advocating for is safe consumption sites where people can go and use drugs safely. And that would be mm -hmm. a solution. But it, they voted on it in a few states in America, but they've always shut it down. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that's a solution. But there's always government pushback for the kind of solutions we're looking for. What do you feel, where do you see a solution that's been, you know, uh, that's been successfully come to success? No, I think the solution, like successful solution I've seen when artists are able to dismantle the moral, the morality behind the solution, like, like the morality that go against the solution. 
Because sometimes social media, like you say, like safe consumption, spaces for safe consumption. And what doesn't let that happen is the, this, you know, morality that is pretending what is right and what is wrong without understanding what is good for the person. Yeah, exactly. Said, no? So I think yeah. that for me is the main uh, obstacle and one thing that I try with my work always to, let's say, confront, you know, so as soon as you take the moral argument out of the conversation, then I hope sometimes that the solution can be somehow implemented or at least advanced, you know? I wish. Yeah. Um, in some countries in Europe, for instance, there's a, for instance, using that as an example, there's uh, a lot of struggle to destigmatize drug use and sex work also. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So well, he, I, I care about. Now here, this is still very stigmatized and also we don't have the concept of sex worker doesn't, it's not that advanced. And for example, the other day, the police uh, raid uh, Insta, which is the space where we do the, the project that we have here for art and activism. And as soon as I heard they surround the house and they wanted to enter the house, I had to call international press to say that the in the house we didn't have drugs, we didn't have pornography, and we didn't have any seditious political books because these are used against you know political fighters you know like and did it fighters. work did, did they arrest it, it worked it worked because sometimes they plant they plant drugs in your house of course. Of course. or they do this kind of stuff and of course people hear the discussion about drugs is very it's very elemental at the moment here it's quite naive there is not so much education about it so people immediately think you know many things that are supposition about the person and uh, you know so that is quite effective to destroy somebody's reputation here by planting some drug in the house or pornography or something like that so the stigma is very strong there around drugs it's quite strong but is there quite a strong. problem and at the same time you have a huge population yeah at the same time you have a huge population of young people who are consuming. Yeah, that's what I wondered. Uh, that they, are the pharmaceutical, uh, you know, the pharmaceutical drugs, they could, but also pills. Also they pills. what? That's what I was going to ask. Do the pharmaceutical companies yeah, make they are, they also consume Cuba? Yeah, so the same problem. We don't have this here. We don't have it here. We don't huh? have pharmaceutical companies. We have, it's a state run everything. So basically what happens is you have corruption. Like you have people in the pharmacy selling illegally or without recipe, you know, recipes or they make it fake for you uh, to young people. And there is a lot of traffic with pharmaceuticals, uh, downers, uppers and all this stuff. Um, but yeah, it's a conversation that still needs to happen. Yeah. In a, in a, in a good way, you know, you you start seeing now on TV a number that say if you have drug problem, call. But I think this is not enough. I'm you need to start the conversation. I'm you need to start the conversation. Who's and, running that and, site? That's the question. Who are you going to get when you yeah. make that call? State. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. The state, you know, psychologist or whatever. And for example, we had the case of a friend of ours who is an artist and who was doing a, a group of videos against a, a law, a censorship law that we had in the 349. And he was doing these small videos of one hour each, interviewing like 60 artists, different artists yeah. and so on. And the government was very mad at those videos coming up on Facebook and people you know, looking at them and protesting because that law was unfair. And they planted, they, they trick him because oh, no. he, he, he said, you know, he, he, he smoked marijuana and, yeah. um, and they actually trick him. They, 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 they put a guy to sell him the, the oh, no. weed and then they waited until he had it on his hand yes. and they accused him of trafficker, not consumer, oh, but trafficker. 
So this has been a very difficult case for us because it's hard here to say this artist who is an activist who is actually doing this series of documentary, documentary series against a law that was passed by the president in Cuba against artists is okay to be free, even if, you know, it's very hard for people to understand that. People immediately dismiss this uh, this argument, the drug addict is, yeah, it's, it's quite. Marijuana has heavy charges around it. It's the same, it's the same charges, same charges. It's treated the same way. As what? As, as cocaine or anything else or heroin or anything else. Yeah, yeah, but there is no culture here with this. Within your group, for instance, within the all these people you work with, there's no discussion of drug use or that it, it's very that stigmatized even with that is discussed hmm. yeah they they are some people who consume but this is so dangerous to to say to be said in public and and when i say consume is weed i don't say anything hard no it's just weed but it is so stigmatized and and they can go to prison for a few years I don't remember if it's five or 10 years or something like that, if they take you consuming, cash you consuming, that nobody talks about it. It's like, you know. And for example, my case, just to be clear, in case the government is listening, I yeah. never, ever, ever, ever consume Drugs. anything. Because what? I know that I don't want to give them the chance, you know? Yeah. Well, yeah. Where the government so, is listening. No, this is a... I hope sometimes this is, I hope these conversations start to be more open in Cuba and more public and and has a forum because I think, you know, the reason people arrive, at least in Cuba, to, to consumption is through a lot of social despair and, and, and lack of hope and, you know, and, and not seeing a future, at least in Cuba. In Cuba, this yeah. is very, well, very... That's very much a part of uh, lack of services here, poverty. Um, exactly. I think yeah. Was, yeah, heroin use can be, I don't know, you can find that, but there's also people starting to come together as drug users and support each other and try to- We don't have that here. No, it's we don't too have that here. here yet. I think it's pretty radical here. Mm. And so, what about your flag? I love it. You made all the countries <laughs> in the world. I love that. Yeah, it's here. <laughs> let, me... Oh, let me see. Oh, yeah. show it to me. Let me see. It's beautiful. So, mm -hmm. each continent is there? Yeah, everything is here. <laughs> yeah. No, I, do, I don't believe in borders. So, no, that's, my, that's my other fight. Like yeah. I think we should. It's the same. It's the same. It's it's related to what you were talking about, exactly. Like rich people and people who, by people who who can travel freely, you know, yeah. and even establish themselves what they want and and test that I want to try here, I want to try there. But then there are people who are you know criminalized who want to have a new life, you know. So okay. I, I I am. The Sacklers are all over, you know, they're, they yeah, have houses exactly. and all these And yeah, there's, I guess I never saw the difference between their freedom of movement and the mass immigration. I never saw the connection. Yeah. But I see the yeah. connection of these drug dealers not going to jail when people exactly. are going to jail for a little bit of pot of marijuana. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly. the concept. That's the context, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But I don't believe in nation states either. Me believe. neither, me neither. I think it's... I can't remember ever believing it. And I I don't believe in America as a nation. <laughs> I mean, there's two Americas now anyway, but I was always ashamed of being American. And, <laughs> you know, when I went to Europe, I always said, I'm not American, I'm a New Yorker. So, That's good. We're yeah. going to make you an honorary Cuban. Uh, thank you. I would <laughs> love that. 
very cool. Okay, cool. So yeah, yeah. Okay. so we, we need to keep our fight. Yes, we each of us. We should Good intertwine. Luck. Yes, please play safe, please. Yeah. yeah, you too, please. You too, because I have to say that even the work you're doing is drainy and it's hard and you need to take time, you know, to for yourself as well. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. also I, I worry about uh, rich people, you know, I worry about my my actual physical safety. Sometimes we got followed. We That's had a, absolutely. We had a, a PI outside parked in front of my house for a few days, following my assistance. That was really scary. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean that. Yeah. I mean, corporations have become almost like nation states. You know, they have their okay. own security. They have their own. Yeah. You know. They have everything. Yeah, uh, it's a, it's a scary. They persecute people at the same. You know, yeah. You should you should take care of yourself as well, and yeah, to stay safe. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Much love. Bye. 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 <laughs>